It's me, Vera, here to remind you that this is an adult podcast. That means we're going to deal with tough topics. Take a break if you need it, and be kind to yourself, because we sure won't be. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Crack Crown Season 2, Episode 5. As always, I am your storyteller, Mike Martin. Today, I am joined by none other than Jason. And Jason, it's been a few weeks. I'm very excited. Uh, And welcome back to the show, my busy boy. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, where uh, do you, we'll go over a little bit with you uh, where we left off, but uh, I'm sure you remember getting on the boats and having the boat fight. And uh, after the boat fight, everybody kind of went to shore after that for the most part. And that's where we left off. Who could forget a good boat fight? Who could forget a good boat fight? I don't think you uh, saw the other boat fight, but let's just say your boat out of the two of them was the one that went the smoothest. Oh, gosh. Well, ours did not go exactly as planned. <laughs> And, and it went, it went the smoothest, which just tells you something. Um, mm-hmm. but we're, uh, yeah, it's just you and me today. We've got a little bit of a snapshot of a solo session here, uh, where we watch as Robert returns back to Chicago after some time away. Uh, if those who don't remember way back when we did like a live show special at, oh God, I can't remember what convention it was at this point. That was Robert's introduction. He was brought to us that thanks to Prince Jackson, who was interested in the coterie who was on their way into that area from New York. And he's been with them ever since. So, uh, it was either yeah. dragon con or yeah. Gen con. Oh, Gen con. Cause I did not go to dragon con. Okay. So it had to have been Gen con, but uh, before we jump in a big, thank you to everybody out there for watching, uh, just listening to the show, sharing the show is one of the best ways you can support us here at pod by night. Uh, but if you want to go above and beyond, you can over to patreoncom slash pod by night, where, uh, your support there goes to making sure everybody's taken care of and trying to keep this little show of ours rolling forward as best we can. Uh, and if you just want to jump into the community, our Discord, uh, which there should be a link in the description of the podcast, is totally free to join. You can jump in. And everybody in there loves talking uh, theories and what's going to happen next. And there was an entire two seasons of people taking bets on what clan Robert was until it was finally officially revealed not that long ago. But uh, with that said, let's not uh, pad this out any longer. Let's go ahead and set the scene things in and see where our dear Robert was left off. Robert, as we fade in to a bustling Chicago night, after having hit the shores with Vera and what half of your coterie seemed to arrive on time, while the other boat containing the other members of your coterie seemed late and not to arrive, uh, not arriving when expected, You, Vera, and Max moved away from the port for a little while. But you, on the other hand, have people here. Robert has people he's known, worked with, contacts all through Chicago, a home that Gary never was. And as the smell of the Chicago's uh, waters, uh, the port rather, where the ferry party boat pulled in, the smells of the streets of Chicago, the hustle and bustle of the voices and the cars ripping by and horns honking, It's nostalgic and probably a little uh, comforting to be in a city that you are much more familiar with. Mm -hmm. And as you stride into the sidewalk and pick a little, maybe a little bit of a break away from Vera as Vera walks away to meet up with a particular mortal that, you know, she has somebody here. You know, she has a ghoul here. You've heard the name. Uh, And she steps away to go make a phone call to contact him and hopefully find a place for this half of the coterie to find peace and quiet for the night while the rest, or while they wait impatiently rather, for Sean and Duke and Mia to come from the other boat. And it's when they walk away and you're left at the corner of a sidewalk as people are bustling by, that a black black, uh, sedan with tinted windows rolls up gently with the half drawn down window on the passenger side. And a pale face you are not familiar with peers through to the other side, uh, to to you through the people. W- uh, motions for you to come a little closer. Who are you motioning me? As you uh, speak that, um, do you move closer or do you stay where you are and you say that where you're at? I stay where I am. Looks annoyed and rolls his eyes uh, kind of in a half-cocked manner before he brings his hand down. He says, the prince summons you. And he rolls his window up wordlessly, not giving you an opportunity to reply. And the sedan rolls away. <sighs> 
You know where the ivory tower is in Chicago, one of the tallest buildings in the center of the city. And there's where the prince operates on almost a nightly basis. I look at a random passerby and I say, he didn't even offer me a ride. What's the world coming to today, hmm? As uh, you, you stop this random passerby, this middle-aged man with a bit of a portly belly and a half-burnt cigarette all the way through his lips gives you a raised eyebrow and actually stutter steps as you start speaking to him with such confidence and bravado. And uh, he tries to kind of like keep walking a little bit and maintain eye contact. And if you don't say anything, it's like a civilian trying to get, uh, it's like a civilian uh, person trying to get away from somebody who's talking crazy at them on the street. <laughs> He's kind of just like putting his distance and accidentally bumps into somebody behind him and he looks around, and looks back to you to make sure you're not following him. And then he begins to walk away. <laughs> Fine. Off Robert strides through the myriad of smelly, smelly kind, a mix of alcohol, cigarettes, sweat, and of course that sweet vitae that courses through their veins. What hunger is uh, Robert at? I imagine you're at probably like a hunger two. So you're not that hungry. You're actually doing all right. Does Robert hail a cab? Does he or does he truly just walk uh, to the ivory tower? I hail a cab. You maybe even walk a few paces before you're like, am I probably think to yourself, am I really going to walk? So you turn around and the arm flies up and you're used to hailing cabs here in Chicago. And as we watch a yellow vehicle slowly pull over, at the tall, uh, the, the rather uh, dominating or domineering rather is a much better word building that sits at the center of Chicago that is now, that is known to the kindred as the ivory tower where the prince resides, where he sleeps, where the council comes to have meetings and so on. And here you stride through large double doors into a, a giant uh, vestibule where a front desk with a few people working behind it uh, sits kind of quietly in a room where nobody is standing or sitting regardless of the benches and chairs that are aligned or around for people to sit and relax on. It looks much more like a museum piece or a diorama of a, of a uh, kind of center room for a building that is much more for viewing than for using. And as you walk up, a young man with a well-trimmed goatee and short-cut hair with dark brown eyes looks up to you, Robert, with a well-trained human resources smile and says, Hello, sir. How can I help you tonight? Apparently, I was summoned. He gives you, again, that uh, trained smile without an, a crack in the facade and simply says, Oh, can I have your name then, sir? Let me uh, make sure that everything's uh, accounted for here. Um, may I determine who this person is? You would know well from being in the ivory tower multiple times over the course of years that you simply need to say that the, uh, you can simply say that the prince is expecting you or use open kindred terminology within the ivory tower. Yes. And it's safe. Oh, Robert Creslington, the fourth. He uh, doesn't even bat an eye or raise an eyebrow. He uh, looks down to his monitor, a few keystrokes and clatterings later, and then a phone call with a muttering, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, before he clicks it up and says, yes, the prince is expecting you. Um, in about 10 minutes, if you want to head back to the back elevator and head to the, and that before you can even finish his sentence, you actually hear a distant uh, woman's voice coming down from the, the hallway where he was gesturing toward the elevator. And she goes, Robert? And as you look up, what you see is one of a, a familiar face to you, one of the uh, people that typically sit behind this desk, one of the helpers, the secretaries, as it were, of the ivory tower, who's usually working the nights that you would come in and come visit the ivory tower for a prince's request. And she smiles, haven't seen you in about a year or so as you were out in Gary for a while. And uh, she cuts off that other guy and simply says, I haven't seen you in forever. I thought, well, I thought the worst. And she walks up past the desk and uh, doesn't go to hug you or anything, but does like go to put out her hand to shake your hand. Well, you can think the worst, but with me, always expect the best. As you say that, she actually has a, uh, a look of confusion and she jumps. I forgot that was your real accent. <laughs> That's right. I had to, I decided to get in touch with my old self and uh, strip the bonds that were upon me when I took my persona of the Chicago sports fan. She nods. She's like, is that like a, like a vampire midlife crisis thing? 
<laughs> well, if this is my midlife crisis, then uh, I've got nothing to worry about. I've got plenty of years to go. She uh, she smiles and kind of realizes how what she said doesn't make sense in terms of immortal creatures, but uh, goes on clearly throwing on a jacket. She's like, well, it's great to see. Well, I'll be seeing more of you. I've got to go. I have a date. Uh, have a wonderful date. I have no idea if you'll be seeing more of me or not, but I've been summoned. She uh, raises her eyebrows. Sounds important. It, I'm sure it is. Uh, she uh, she then uh, kind of gives a pleasant smile. She's like, well, I honestly got to be going. Uh, I got uh, have, have a great time. Her name, by the way, was Erin. Enjoy your date, Erin. As she walks by, uh, the gentleman behind the desk just gives you a pleasant smile and simply continues what he was saying. Back elevator, top floor. Right, right. Robert strides by and we can hear his footsteps on the uh, tile echoing through the rather empty room. The ding of an elevator and the gentle rolling of the doors as he steps in. And with the single press of a button and the doors closing, the elevator jerks gently and you begin moving your way up the myriad of floors. The doors roll open. Before you are gorgeous double oaken doors. They are swung open by two, flanked by two private security. And as it's opened, you step into a room with a large glass wall on the other side that overlooks the entirety of Chicago, giving one of the best views of Chicago's skyline that you can possibly remember. It may have been a while since you've been in this room before, but once you step in, you can hardly forget what a gorgeous sight it is from up here. Jackson stands speaking with some no name, likely an assistant of his with his bald head, hands behind his uh, body and a nice, clean, perfectly tailored suit. And when he looks over to the door's opening and Robert strolling in, he quickly finishes his conversation, ushers off whoever it is, and that individual hurries by you without dare looking you in the eye. And Jackson steps before his rather simple wooden desk with a simple chair, not a lot of papers or decoration really anywhere in this large room. And with a, we'll say, a pleasant smile, though subtle it may be, he simply says, it's good to see you, Robert. My prince! And I do an over-exaggerated gentlemanly bow. Sarcasm dripping from every syllable. And as he closes the gap between you with his own footsteps in his perfectly polished dress shoes, he does say, I did miss your sarcasm. <laughs> well, uh, there I was, just simply enjoying a completely normal and uh, uninteresting boat party when I disembarked, what happened? I was summoned by you. I had uh, by the way, your summoner, I know they say don't shoot the messenger, but your summoner didn't even offer me a ride. My apologies, and I'll ensure he's reprimanded for such a rude action. And you can tell, you can hear the very gentle playfulness behind it. I did hear that the two, that you and your coterie were returning to Chicago this evening. However, this is the first I've heard of any difficulties on the ride home. Perhaps I should wait until I have the entire coterie before me before I ask for details. I didn't summon you for a report, Robert. I summoned you because I need you. Well, one always likes to be needed. Yes, I mean, I could give you my side of what happened on the boat, but I know there were several boats. Perhaps it's better if we all come together at once to discuss uh, the boat happenings. And I'm sure I'll hear plenty of different stories before I hear your version of it as well. You mean the truth. I always tell the truth. You know that, Prince. That is why you have kept me around for so long, isn't it? As you say that, he spins, he, he gently spins on like the ball of his foot and begins walking back to his desk, but keeping his head gently looking over his left shoulder. It's why I have you here now and why I'm about to ask you a favor. He makes his way to the desk and uh, he spins, or he, he walks around it, pulls open a drawer and, and pulls out a simple manila envelope. He puts it onto the desk gently and slides it forward. We've had a problem here in Chicago, one that nobody's been able to take care of. And I think you have the tools and the means of doing it as you have in the past. Are you interested in hearing more? I am intrigued also to do a favor for a prince. It's not something that is an opportunity that comes along very often. So, of course, I'm ready for you, my liege. He, he flips open the front of the, the, the manila envelope and before you is a picture, uh, 
paperclip to a few papers. And he simply says, I've had an issue within the Malkavian domain. An individual by the name of Elias has been causing problems amongst the kind and kindred alike. Masquerade breach threat and loss of life that shouldn't be, causing us to expend monetary and personnel to cover the masquerade breaches happening within the territory. He's had a warning, one that I am loathe to give, but a deserved one. He's ignored it. I need him removed. Well, uh, so he just needs to be removed. You have permission to bring final death to him if need be. This is most unusual and extraordinary circumstance and request. Uh, of course, my prince, I shall carry it out at once. I, he must really be... Uh, His name is Elias Bouchard. And yes, he's causing us a hell of an issue. He's holed himself up in some abandoned theater up in town to the north outside of the city's rack. Civilians have gone in. Some have come out. Most have not. Those that have have come out babbling insane nonsense. And a two kindred I've sent in have not returned. I expect the worst. Consider it done. I shall leave immediately. And let us hope that he is just holding those kindred prisoner or in thrall and that he has not given them final death. I'll investigate that as well once I take care of the problem. Prince Jackson nods seemingly pleased with your response and closes the manila envelope and slides it to you. If you have any questions, please ask. If you're needing of any equipment to take care of this, please do not hesitate. I'll provide. Do you have weapons? Self-defense? Well, uh, whew, perhaps some body armor hidden underneath my suit might uh, be called for here. We're not really sure what I'm walking into. Uh, he, uh, when you say that and kind of linger, like I'm not sure what I'm walking into, Malkavian. Expect your mind to be pushed to fracture. Hmm. Do I have any sort of items that could shield me from that? He shakes his head. A strong will. Should your turn successful, I'll reward you appropriately. That's all you need to say, my friend. My liege. And he nods and says, uh, <sighs> Sir Robert, as you spin to walk away, and you make your way to the double doors, just as you begin to open them, you simply hear him say, and Robert, it's good to have you back. It's good to be back. And Robert steps with confidence back into the elevator and down to the first floor. You were, of course, in that manila envelope, the address and so on was given to you. And I imagine, uh, are we seeing Robert heading there immediately? Uh, is he like heading right there to take care of the job without a, a second thought or like, Without hesitation, should I say? Yes. I would like to say that he has his typical weapons, like his um, his handgun. Do you take a stake with you? I do. I was about to mention that. You would be provided with, uh, how many would you like? Because uh, the prince would provide you with uh, professionally crafted stakes. I would like three. We never know those two other kindred that he sent in there. God forbid they're beyond help and also need to be staked. Unlike a lot of common stakes that are kind of found within, uh, you know, uh, say hunters who come hunting for you that are from the, like civilians from the streets. These are, like I said, not only um, professionally crafted, but the tips are adorned with a very sharp metal, making it a little easier to pierce through that much more difficult kindred skin. Uh, so you're provided with three of those. Um, you have your your uh, handgun. We don't worry about ammo for it. And uh, if there's anything else, you're, does your character have uh, any armor? Does he wear armor? No. So that's what I was requesting from the prince. Kevlar? Yep. You would get a Kevlar vest then, which would uh, do you well against bullet shots that come at you. So as our uh, as a scene comes to another close and we fade to dark, when we fade back in just over the shoulder of Robert Kreslington, we're in the cross the street as a few cars pass by and we can see a dim orange glow from the street light above. We see the abandoned theater, very particularly a theater known as Cat's Uptown Theater. This was once a hustling and bustling place out in North Town, right out in North Broadway specifically. And those who live in Chicago might actually recognize this as an actual theater that has been abandoned and is currently a US National uh, Register of Historic Places, a Chicago landmark. 
And as you stroll, uh, as you sit across from this place, as its uh, lights are off, there's two vans parked in front of it, and a few of the windows have tarp pulled over the fronts of them. You don't hear anything from here. You stride across the street when the cars finish, and you move your way up to the front doors. And as you pull on the front doors, maybe even expecting them to be locked, they swing open with ease. The smell of musty air overwhelms you as, a, as it rushes by you, sucked into the street outside. And you step into what you might likely assume is a damp and old red carpet that was once probably vibrant, but now dulled with time. The doors swing closed behind you, and with that smell and the muted streets, uh, the muted sounds of the street behind you, you also begin to hear something else. Wits awareness, please. Okay. One success. As you step in, you think you hear a voice, but it's hard to make out what it says or truly understand it. Not because it's so quiet, but because the other sounds of instruments fading in and out, strumming a guitar that strums a random chord, a drum that seems to immediately come in and give a solo for a wholly different song, the sound of a bass plucking away at a jazz-like tune, all fade in and out chaotically with no sense, rhyme, reason, or rhythm behind it. It echoes like memories of a past or music uh, stuck deep underwater making its way to your ears. It's not overwhelming, but it is everywhere. Um, I very loudly yell out in my Bob Kowalski persona. <laughs> Hey, and I got a delivery here for a Mr. Uh, Elias Butchard. <laughs> Anybody here? I, this is the address they gave me. As you say, Elias Butchard, while no one replies, the music swells. You can hear it much louder, truly overwhelming. But after you finish your sentence, it kind of goes back to its more light, dull sounding uh, volume. Sorry, I don't speak instrument. Anybody speak English around here? <laughs> do you uh, stay where you are or are you walking in when you, why are you walking forward when you do that? Or are you just kind of like taking a minute and just sh trying to see what reactions you pull? I'm standing there. Yeah. After you kind of shout around a bit and the music does its thing where it's kind of rises as you speak and then dulls when you stop. Maybe even to a point where Robert begins to get frustrated. You do hear something, perhaps in response to what you're saying. But you hear whooping and hollering coming from the main theater. A couple of claps. Someone shouting, encore! 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 Loudly, but with no emotion behind it. I walk towards that, then. As you walk forward, uh, of course, like any theater, there's doors that lead into it. Uh, and you can see through a window. There's a little window you could see through if you wanted to look through into the main performance room before walking in there. I will do that. Like a box office through a window or something? Yep, exactly. Give me a uh, wits awareness. Hopefully better than the last time. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Four successes. Way better. Okay. So as you peer through the window to see what's actually going on in there, the first thing you see is pretty obvious. On the main stage, you see a haphazard mix of instruments. Not even an entire drum set, just two or three pieces of it and a hi-hat, no cymbals whatsoever. You see a guitar laying on the ground, but... Is that only two strings that seem to be attached to it and one that's broken while the others are missing entirely? Uh, you actually don't see a bass, even though you can hear it. But amid, amongst it, you actually see an individual rapidly pacing between each one. His hair is awry and about, we'll say, ear length, and it's matted and brown. He's a longer beard that reaches down to, um, like, just a, like down to his, like, a, we'll say down to his belly button, like that really long style beard. And uh, he's, his clothes look completely mismatched. He's wearing basketball shorts and a dress shirt with a tie that's hanging down toward the center, not fully tightened, red color. And you just see him walking over to the drums and he quickly pats the drums and then taps the hi-hat and he nods to himself. He goes over to the guitar, strums it a couple times, puts his hands over his ears, goes down. You see him actually just grab one of the strings and pull it until it breaks. Then he plucks the one last string and nods to himself. And he looks out to the crowd and... As you look out to where he's looking, you actually see four figures. You can barely see some of their heads over the chairs, and one of them is half standing, giving a half-hearted 
standing ovation. So there's only two. You see four people in the chairs, one of the four people standing up, uh, and then you see an individual on the stage, so five total, and the individual on the stage is the one running back and forth between the instruments. And as you can see him from here, he looks like the, it, it's very clearly Elias Bouchard, as you've seen a picture of him within, within the file that was given to you. Can I tell by the back of the head of the other four people if they are two of the kindred that were missing? That would be hard to tell from here. Um, the only way I would give you, I'll give you a roll. Uh, it's not impossible, but it'd be really hard to tell. And it would be a wits awareness roll. All right. With one success, it's really, really hard to tell from here in the back of their heads if it's uh, which of these four, if any of them are kindred. Does uh, Robert step into the main theater room or does he watch for a while? He's going to watch. So as you, Elias runs back and forth between all of the instruments, after about five minutes of doing it in a, in a way that seems to be just nonsense, he looks out to the crowd and the person who's clapping is still clapping. And he literally just like motions with his hand toward them to sit down and they do. He quickly runs into the back behind the curtains and he's gone for about a minute or two before he waddles his ass out with a giant painting that he leans up against the drum set um, that is uh, dripping with color. Uh, it's clearly two people, um, and uh, it's hard to tell exactly who these two people are from here. Um, but before you can even really re react, he runs back behind the curtain again, and then he comes out with two more smaller pit paintings that he lays down on the floor. Uh, and as he looks over them, the three of them, he goes to the really big one again, picks it up, walks to the front of the stage, and then holds it up above him, almost Lion King with baby Simba style. And as he does so, um, three of the four people start clapping wildly. And it's here when he holds it up, you can see the painting pretty well. And what you see is clearly uh, two figures, one of them being himself, Elias Bouchard, painted himself on this painting with a remarkable talent, might I add. While it's chaotic looking and the colors are dripping and things are kind of like, I don't want to say broken or, or like a Picasso style, but kind of airing in that direction, you still can tell one is Bouchard and the other one catches your eye, not because it's so bizarre, but because it looks so goddamn familiar. Is that Max? A purple kindred with bald head, that monstrously long ears and uh, like the long bony purple fingers, all of it matches. You've never seen an Osferatu like Max before and you're, you are swear you're looking at him in that painting. Very strange. If I had my druthers, I would leave now and question Max, find out what his connection was. But uh, that should have to wait for another night. You swing the doors open. And I, do you, much like before, you don't hide yourself at all. You just open the doors and walk right into the, the uh, auditorium. No hiding. No hiding. You, as you stride through, it actually catches him off guard. The doors swing open, and as you step in, he quickly jerks and puts the painting to his side. And as he looks, he kind of squints his eyes and ruffles his brows, and he doesn't seem to recognize you, but then puts his painting down. He goes, I uh, I don't remember doing, maybe I did I? It's fine. Um, Just take a seat, take a seat, take a seat. The more the merrier. This is one of my greatest performances I have ever put together. And the more people that'll listen, the better. Maybe... Maybe you can feel the things I want you to feel. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, sure. And I go and sit down. Please, please. And he waves his hands. No apologies needed. I'm just so happy you came. I cautiously take a seat, make sure there's no strange restraints or something that could trap me. My clarifying question then is, where does he sit? Do you stay in the back where the door was or do you move closer? To oh, the I stay in the back where the door is. <laughs> As you uh, go to pull up a seat, now that you're in the room and you actually are kind of like have a much grander vision uh, of who's around, obviously those four people that are there are still there, but you can now also see at least three other bodies having been killed, no blood, they simply are hunched over in their chair in varying uh, in varying pieces, uh, in varying stages, rather, of decomposition. Mm. One's fresh. One looks like almost mummified, which is very weird. And the other one seems to be in the midst of rotting. And then you have the other four who are, you know, enjoying the performance. You, dra you grab a seat, you plop it down, and he goes, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Please sit down. My name is Elias. 
Bouchard, and I am here to perform. And he drops to an extremely deep bow, throws his arms to his sides and makes his, and he even bends his knees. And uh, somebody starts whistling and the others start clapping. And tonight, I'm going to take everything that I've been doing over the past, how long, fucking, uh, fucking three, four years and create a display of music and, and art. Thank you very much. And then he takes another deep bow after a very long, awkward pause and people start clapping again and whatnot. And he stands up and he straightens his shirt out and he tightens up the tie finally. But it's now that it's tightened up, you can very clearly tell the tie is too small. Uh, and he walks over to the one string guitar, picks it up and says, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. And he immediately and then he strings, uh, strums a single string. And as he does so, Robert, Give me a, an intelligence resolve check. So since because it's two attributes, you might have to roll it manually, um, but that'll be 5d10 for you. Mm. Cool. All right. As he strums that one string, instead of hearing one string plucked out into the veritable empty auditorium, you instead hear an entire set of strings play. You hear him play a chord as he strums down. And as he does so, Perhaps even confusion washes over Robert's face because you truly only see the single string. But as he strums it and you hear it, he pulls back and he begins strumming again. And every time you're actually hearing guitar music play. And as he looks over to the drums and he gestures to them, like as though he's gesturing for somebody to continue playing them, you actually then suddenly hear a drum set uh, kick in entirely complete, not the incomplete drum set that you see up there. And it's playing along with the guitar that he is clearly strumming, but isn't working as intended. And then he points to the bass and the same thing happens, but you don't see anything. The drum isn't actually being played. The bass doesn't get picked up off the ground, but you hear the music. And after a few moments of actually hearing the music, you actually begin to feel joy bubble up inside you. Not overwhelming joy, not something that completely dominates you and overtakes you, but just a little bit of a joy begins to bubble up in front of inside you. How does, what does Robert do at that moment? I try to resist the charms that are clearly coming over me. Absolutely. So you, uh, you, you take a moment and you're like, fuck, I, I know what this, this is not right. I don't want this to, whatever is about to happen. God, I don't want it to happen. So go ahead and make me another uh, resolve, compo uh, intelligence resolve check. And before you do, um, you can, uh, just as a reminder, what you can do too is you can rouse the blood and you can add 2d10 to whatever roll you want. So if you wanted to uh, rouse the blood first and then re-roll with an additional 2d10, you can. One success. You know, it's, uh, it happens. Oh, you also can use a willpower, remember, uh, to re-roll three of your day failed it. dice. So you can give me another 3d10 by using a willpower. There we go. Hey, you got two more successes. So three successes. As Robert hears the music and at the moment you feel your emotions begin to be manipulated and that little joy begin to uh, bubble up inside you, you know it's superficial. It's artificial. It's being imposed upon you. And you take a moment, just take, uh, think to yourself. And as you rouse the blood and close your eyes, you sever the connection. You roll enough where all of a sudden the music fades back into that discordant, muted, dull tones that make no sense. And now when he strums down on the single string, all you hear is that one Bow. single out of tune string. He clearly doesn't know that you're not enthralled and he's still playing and like really into it and enjoying himself. And the crowd is obviously not, uh, is obviously enthralled by this. I'm going to rush the stage. Okay. And tackle him. Okay. I love it. So we don't have to roll for your running, but I do need you to make me a strength brawl check, please. Three successes. I need to crit in order for this to work. I did not crit. So we see uh, Roberts jump up from his seat and without giving a second thought, sprints down the aisle to the front stage, leaps up over the uh, rather large gap from where you need to get to onto the stage with elegance and ease landing on his feet. And before Elias can even react to your presence on stage, you grab him by the waist, hoist him up, and slam him down into the ground. The guitar bounces onto the ground, giving a guang again as it slides away. Hang on. Yeah, like that. Yeah, and it slides across the floor as Elias is slammed onto his back 
with Robert over him, holding him by by uh, his waist, and I imagine grabbing his collarbone or collars as he holds him to the ground. And he looks panicked, wide eyed, and ha, 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 and he goes to say nothing. Uh, he goes to say something rather, and all he can do is just pant and seem extremely nervous. What do you do? Well, I assess. Can I? Subdue him, or should I just stake him? In Vampire the Masquerade, when you stake somebody, it doesn't kill them. It immobilizes them permanently. So staking somebody puts them into torpor, and they basically just become a lifeless corpse, but they're still in their mind. They're still alive. So that's a good way to immobilize someone and then do whatever you want with them. And then bring him to the print and then take the stake out. Perfect. All right. That's, I'm going to attempt to stake him. Okay. You take your stake out, and this is going to be, instead of a uh, strength brawl, I'm going to ask for a strength athletics roll from you, please. And this stake will give you a, a automatic one extra success. Aha. Six. Holy crap, you rolled incredibly. Holy shit. So on top of the five, yeah, on top of the five you rolled, you get the one from the stake, you being a bonus of six. Even if you take two sex successes away from that for it being a called shot, you roll more than enough. Uh, and as you pull the stake out, where I, where are you to keep? Are you keeping the stakes like inside your like a belt? Would you have like a little a holster for the stakes that you that you slide them in and out of? They're in, they're inside my suit pocket, so it's just oh, psh, even, psh, and, and elegant. Yeah, they're, so you reach into your suit pocket, you pull one out as he's panicked. You have your hand over his like his mouth or his neck, holding him down as you raise your arm up and slam it in, piercing the skin, breaking the ribs. He immediately goes inert. His body just drops. His eyes stay open. His mouth stays open. He is in torpor, which is permanent paralyzation. Um, he is aware of his surroundings. He can see you. He can hear you, all that stuff. But he cannot move until the wood is removed from his heart. And as you stake him and his eyes kind of lie open and his mouth lies open, you actually hear, what the, what the fuck? Where am I? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And as you look over, you see three, the, th the four people start coming to their senses and one of them, clearly a, a kind, not a kindred, uh, a mortal, sees a dead body and begins to panic. Do not panic. Everything is fine here. You're having a nightmare. <laughs> so, would you like to use awe, for one? It's a free ability. You don't have to rouse, but you have the ability to yes. draw the people's attention, if that's something you're looking to do. So, with awe on, what I need you to make me is a charisma persuasion roll and then you're going to add 4d10 extra onto that because you're using awe which is an enormous pool for you i it think is. holy shit you're going to be rolling 12d10 that might be the biggest pool we've ever actually had <laughs> you you messy you messy critical which is actually fine uh because there's no real way to messy critical here so you rolled a total of six successes again um, and as you kind of wave your hand out and you're like, it's fine, it's fine. It's all just a terrible uh, kind of nightmare or whatever it is. Um, you actually realize, because you can feel the eyes on you and a little bit of the resistance, two of them are kindred. Uh, they kind of just give you an eye and um, one of them just actually walks up to the stage, clearly kind of resisting your awe and just says, thank you. Mm. I'll take care of. And she gestures to the other uh, one of the mortals. I'll take care of him if you want to take care of her. And he, she points to the other mortal who was about to panic because of the uh, dead body. Very well. Now, you can entrance this mortal if you'd like, which you simply could tell them pretty much to go do anything other than hurt themselves or hurt someone they love. And they will just obey without question, including being like, hey, this was just like a nightmare. This was like a terrible art piece that you came out to see or whatever. And uh, so if you'd like to use that, you can. This is the worst art installation you have ever visited. <laughs> this was all just a nightmare. You will return home. I, I just need a rouse check from you. Very well. Okay. You don't get any hungrier. But wait, I, I do say you will give me your address and phone number. You will go home, but I may question you later. Uh, the, the woman walks forward and uh, like locked eyes with you and she goes, yeah, of course. I can't believe it. I thought it was real. I forgot that I was at an art art installation. Hang on. And she reaches into her purse and she pulls out like a piece of uh, paper. She tears off of like a back of her seat. Uh, she grabs a pen that she has in there and she quickly scribbles down her address and her phone number and just hands it up to you on the stage. And she goes, thanks. I can't. I should ask for a refund. You should. I will see if we can process that for you. We'll, we'll be in touch. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. I'm surprised. Oh, you're so helpful. And she uh, kind of like feels a lot better and you can see the confidence in her as she kind of stands up straight and she leaves without question. Now, 
You're left with a torpored, staked Malkavian. Are you, what are you gonna do with the body? Are you bringing him to Prince Jackson? Are you gonna bring him to the Coterie? Or are you gonna take him for yourself and do something? No, I'm bringing him to the Prince. Okay. 100%. Then, as you take this torpored body, and uh, there's a few numbers you can call. Actually, you, you, you're you back in Chicago. You can fucking reach out to the Prince and he'll send transport for you and the body. We, we see you maybe go out to a pay phone or a cell phone if you have one, thanks to Sean and his burner phones. Uh, you're able to reach the appropriate contacts. and. What we'll say is we watch a, another dark tinted windowed sedan pull up. Faceless people come in and assist with the body moving into the vehicle. You better give me a ride now. That's where we'll fade to black. And when we return, we'll see what exactly went down between Jackson and Robert. And we'll watch as Robert rejoins the coterie with questions for Max. Until then, everybody. Thank you again, Jason. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.